Press start. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I need to remove that sound. Um, trust we are all well. Amen. Good, good evening, sir. Good evening, everyone. Um, I trust we've had a wonderful day. It's always nice to be in God's presence again, and I trust Amen. God. Hallelujah. Hello, everyone. In Jesus' name. Hello. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. We worship you. We glorify your name. We thank you for another time in your presence. We thank you for drawing us closer to you. We pray, Father, tonight as we have come, Lord, may we be blessed. Mm -hmm. We pray, Lord, speak to us. Mm -hmm. We pray, Lord, transform our lives. Mm -hmm. We pray, Father, at the end of this meeting, may your name be glorified. Mm -hmm. We love you, Father. We exalt you mm -hmm. in Jesus' mighty name. We pray. Mm -hmm. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, once again, we are welcome in Jesus' name. And I trust God that he will reach out unto us tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We continue our study of the book of Hosea tonight, and um, we round up. We round up the book of Hosea tonight, actually, um, and it's been a really, really interesting, interesting book to study. As we know, um, Hosea started off with um, the strange promise, the strange instruction from God for him to marry a prostitute. And he brought in Goma, whose name meant completion. Um, brought Goma in into his house. And can we remove that sound, please? Brought Goma in into his house. And we know what happened. Goma went out to another man. And Hosea had to go and redeem her and bring her back home. And as we said this two weeks ago, and we said it again last week, that in our homes, in our relationships, in our marriages, when we decide, when we choose to work at it, when we decide to make things work, to pay the sacrifice, that it, 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 it allows God to step in and actually make it work for us. Um, in our homes, we, things don't become bad unless we say so, unless we decide that we're not going to work at it again. Somebody said the difference between a good marriage and a bad marriage is that one was worked on and the other was not. When you pay attention, when you when you do what the best you can do, when you start not by asking the other person to change but changing yourself <coughs> first, when you start with that, then um, you will experience a good home. So that was one of the key lessons um, we've seen um, in Hosea and also the fact that God is a merciful God again and again God pointed them out to the sins that they were sinning he pointed them out to the things they were doing wrong but um, he would also forgive them he would also tell them um, that he will reach out to them if they return to him and all of that so those are some of the things we've studied so far I don't know if anybody has any thoughts around our study from either two weeks ago or last week from the book of Hosea before we go into today's study. Anything from anybody, anything that stood out to you, anything you've learned? It says um, if we are going through challenges and even if God is even if God is the author of our challenges, we should always still go back to him mm, for answers. Mm, mm, yeah. Even when we feel God is or even if when we know that God is the author of our challenges uh maybe he's so yeah thank you for saying that we we talked about chastisements last week discipline from god and we read hebrews chapter 12 yeah. we read hebrews chapter 12 and the bible says god disciplines the children he loves yeah god disciplines the children he loves so he says if we're without discipline he says then we're illegitimate we're illegitimate children so um if God disciplines us, that should not be a reason why we run away from him. It should be a reason why we actually draw closer to him. Just like our earthly fathers discipline us too. Okay, yeah. Anything else from anybody in terms of what you've picked up so far? From the book of Hosea? 
we are of great value to God when mm. we compromise it reduces our value yeah compromise reduces our value mm. in God we are already valued and we said last week that we don't need people to validate us we don't need people to tell us how great we are before we know that we are great already because God is our father and a lot of people spend their lives trying to just seeking validation and all that from people and some people are just so needy until somebody says something to them they don't feel they don't feel they don't feel happy people will get to such people might get to work in the morning and oh well, morning everyone and nobody answers and all through that day that person might be thinking oh have i done something wrong did i not dress well is something wrong with me am i not contributing maybe they don't love me here and all of that it's a need there's an issue with esteem there there's an issue with self-worth and we've got to be careful that our, our sense of self-worth does not come from people but rather it comes from god it comes from what god has said about us he says we're fearfully and wonderfully made we are blessed we are above all we are seated with christ in the heavenly places far above all principalities and powers he says god has given unto us all things that that, that, that pertain to life and godliness we are bible says we are complete in him who is the head of all principalities and, and powers and, and even in our relationship every nobody likes a needy partner you know somebody who's always uh, do you love me uh, do you not oh, oh are you looking at somebody else oh, oh you know insecurity insecurity, insecurity. Uh, and sometimes you find children being needy to parents you have parents being needy to children all because of the background they've come from god has created us complete and we must walk in that understanding yes we might have a troublesome path things might have happened to us along the way but we need to allow the word of god shape our thinking not our circumstances allow god's word shape your thinking not your circumstance allow god's word to shape your thinking to shape who you are not your circumstances because things won't always be perfect and even for those people who it seems things are perfect you find out that they also have a sense of emptiness in them so let us allow god's word to shape our thinking and to shape our sense of who we are rather than what somebody says or a situation or circumstance we have gone through all right can i say something pastor can we if we allow god to shape uh, god's word to shape our thinking mm. then it will likely shape our circumstances mm. yeah. yeah because yeah. if we shape our thinking yeah from our thinking come actions exactly our actions come, yeah you know either consequences or circumstances so of course when yeah. god's word shape our thinking then mm. it shapes our circumstances yeah when god's word shape our thinking thanks for that it shapes our circumstances Bible says, he says as a man thinks in his heart so he is as a man think in his heart so he is so if we allow god's word to shape our thinking our thinking is what develops into words that we speak and our thinking is also what develops into the actions that we take all right okay let's go tonight to hosea chapter 10 we've got five chapters to go through so we're going to pick key scriptures from each of the chapters tonight and study them. There's so much, there's so much to learn in these scriptures. I trust that you've read um, these chapters, you've gone through them. Um, tonight, the plan is not to read all of the verses. The plan is to pick out key scriptures, which we will study in turn. All right. So, in Hosea chapter 10, we're going to look at verse 1 to 3, and we're going to look at verse 11 to 13. We're going to look at verse 1 to 3, and we're going to look at verse 11 to 13. So, can come, somebody please read for us Hosea chapter 10, verse 1 to 3. Hosea 
Hosea 10, 1 to 3. Somebody please read for us. Israel empties its vine, mm -hmm. it brings forth fruit for himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he has increased the altars. According to the bounty of his land, they have embellished his sacred pillars. Their heart is divided, now they are held guilty. It will break down their altars. It will ruin their sacred pillars. Mm -hmm. For now they say we have no king, because we did not fear the Lord. And as for a king, what will he do for us? Yeah. yeah, thank you. As for a king, what will he do for us? Okay, so what does it mean by Israel empties his vine and brings forth for himself? Uh, does anybody uh, anybody have an idea? What does that say in another translation? Maybe it would be a lot easier if we look at other translations. Can we have it in NLT, NLT. for example? Can read it in NLT. Um, do you want us to read the NLT version 1 to 3, verse 1 to 3? Yes, correct. The NLT version says, How prosperous Israel is, a luxuriant vine loaded with fruit. Mm -hmm. But the more wealth and the people the people got, the more they poured it on the altars of, of their foreign mm -hmm. gods. Wow. The richer the harvest they bought in, brought in, the more the, the more beautiful the statues and idols they built. The hearts of the hearts of the people were are fickle; they are guilty and must be punished. The Lord will break their foreign altars and smash their many idols. Verse three. Then they will say, "We have no king because we did not fear the Lord." But what's the difference? What could a king do for us anyway? Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now I take us back to verse one, and you, if you are taking down notes, you can write this down. God expects his children to be rich towards him by bearing spiritual fruits. I'll say that two more times. God expects his children to be rich towards him by bearing spiritual fruits. God expects his children to be rich towards him by bearing spiritual fruit. You know, the problem here is that Ephraim or Israel actually brings forth fruit. So that's not a challenge. He was bringing forth fruit, but those fruits were unto himself. The fruits were things he wanted, things he needed, and all that. And because he wasn't bearing spiritual fruits, it was just a matter of time before he started offering those fruits he had born to idols. Mm. He was not growing spiritually. He was growing physically, but not spiritually. Mm. And you know, this, this just, I, 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 I'm so happy we're discussing this tonight because a lot of times, if you ask the average believer, what is your testimony? What is the sign that God has been good to you? What are the normal answers we give? Anyone? Yeah. Money. Money. God has blessed me. God has given me money. Uh, yeah. Any, any other? If you God has me, blessed me with good health. God has blessed me with good health. I have sound health. I'm well in my body. Yeah. Any other? Family job. I have a good job. I have my career is blossoming. Things are working well. I thank God. Yeah. Yeah. Family. Family. Ah, wow. I've got wonderful children. They're in uni or they've started secondary school. You know, it, it, it's amazing. You know, when you talk about families, you know, it, it's amazing the things that excite us as parents. Yeah. It's, it's amazing the things that excite us uh, as parents. You you find a new parent, for example. Oh, my child is a month old. Oh, yes. Amen. Uh, and another parent. My child has just started primary school, nursery, oh, secondary school. My child's going to uni. Oh, oh my child started his first job. 
you know oh my child's getting married oh wow goodness you know i have a grandchild we are all at different stages in life at, and there's nothing more blessed than to enjoy of course each stage of the process but let, 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 let's be honest when people come to church and share their testimonies how many times do you hear a testimony like this praise the lord i thank god because i've been struggling all this while to pray for an hour by the time i spend 30 minutes in prayer i'm tired i don't even know what else mm -hmm. to say but oh, i just doze up and i start dreaming about cows chasing me and all that but <laughs> I thank god I was able to pray for an hour. Praise God. I met my target. <laughs> How many times do we hear testimonies like that in church? Not yeah. all the time. Exactly. No. Do we hear no. I, 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 read, I read my Bible and God opened up his word to me. I gained an understanding. I've always, I've always avoided Ezekiel because it was so deep. I read it and I understood. I understood, you know. If somebody comes up and shares that testimony in church, we, 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 we will try to rejoice with them, but most times it will be half-hearted. We're like, oh, praise the Lord. Next, Israel here was bearing fruit to himself, not to God. Let's go quickly to Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 12. Very quickly, let me show you something there which pertains to what we have just said. Luke chapter 12, please. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 12. And we're looking at, because of time, um, because of time, we'll look at verse, from verse 16. Oh, no, no, from verse 15. Well, NLT. NLT, yeah. Okay. Look 12 from 15 to what? 15 to 21. It says, then he said, beware, gird every, gird against every kind of greed. Mm. Life is not measured by how much you own. Mm. Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns and, big build up and build bigger ones. Mm -hmm. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Mm. Now take it easy. Mm -hmm. drink, eat, drink, and be merry. Mm. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Mm. Then we will get everything you worked for. Mm. Yes, a person is a fool mm. to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Wow. Wow. That, that, that nicely summarizes the point we're making. He says, yes, that verse 21, mm -hmm. a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich, not the word rich, the key word there is a rich relationship with God. Now, let, let, let me say to you, this to you, because we're family, people may not celebrate your spiritual growth, celebrate it yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people may not be eager to hear the testimony of how you fasted from in, instead of breaking your fast at 12 as no more, you broke your fast at 1202. People may not celebrate, <laughs> celebrate yourself. Yeah, people may not, people, people may feel, oh, it's nothing that you've been able to attend Bible study consistently for the last three months celebrate yourself yeah. go out buy yourself a gift Truly. be happy that yes i did xyz yeah. because guess what whether people celebrate us or not god wants us to bear spiritual fruit amen amen okay so that's the first one let's go back to hosea then let's go back to hosea um, like i said lots of things to learn tonight and we'll just try to take it one after the other. Now, in verse 2 of Hosea chapter 10, and I'm back into NKJV, it says, Their heart is divided, 
now they are held guilty. My question to us tonight is, why do people, what does it mean when it says a man's heart is divided in his relationship with God? What does that mean? He says their heart is What does that mean? What um, means heart divided? Go on, uh, um, I'm just going to guess. <laughs> It's just a guess. I think they are, when I look at the Israel, I think their heart is divided between um, God and idols or sort of yeah. like God and the world. Yeah. So they are not tr fully trusted in God because their heart, their heart is divided and, you know, sort of like towards other things. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. Their heart is divided. So it means that they're not fully committed to God. To God, that's yes, it. Exactly. Yeah. They, 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 they are not fully committed to God. And because of that, they're then worshipping idols on the side. That's, what, that's exactly what it means by um, their hearts. Their heart is divided. That when they don't have a loyal, they don't have a loyal heart. They don't have a loyal heart, exactly. They don't have a loyal heart. I wrote, I wrote down here, and you might want to rephrase this in your own way. Ah, oh, actually, there's some scriptures I need to show you. Sorry, sorry. Let's go to 2 Kings 17. 2 Kings 17. I'll show you two scriptures, and then we will round up um, on that. 2 Kings 17, 32 to 33. Somebody please read 2 Kings 17, only two verses, 32 to 33. Just to see the reality of what happens um, in, in the Christian faith, yeah. So they feared the Lord. So they feared the Lord. Positive, yeah. They feared the Lord, yeah. And from every class, they appointed for themselves priests of the high places. Ah, and from every class, they appointed for themselves priests of the high places who sacrificed for them in the shrines. Of the high places. Who sacrificed for them in the shrine of the high places. They feared God, but then they were sacrificing something else. Now look at verse 33. It drives it home. They feared the Lord, yet served their own gods. They feared the Lord, yet served their own gods. Now this is a clear example of our hearts being divided. Many Christians don't live in absolute rebellion or outright rebellion towards God. Like, I don't believe God exists. If I, somebody tells you, God does not exist. You're like, how dare you? My God exists. I love Jesus. I love the Lord. But this is where we run into problems. When we fear the Lord and yet we're serving our own gods. According to the rituals of the nations, among whom they were carried away. So how how did they? So so even though they were Israelites and they feared God, they saw things happening around them. They saw people worshiping other idols, and in a bit to fit in, in a bit not to look different, in a bit you know when people are like, oh you know your Christianity is just too harsh. Is 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 I once had a cousin and um, her friend said, you know what we love you. You are a social Christian. We love you. you. You're a social Christian. Your own Christianity is not this, you know, this, you don't do anything and all that. No, you do everything we do and yet you're a Christian. We love you. Uh, my question is, who loves you more? Is it God or is it those people? You know, so our heart shouldn't be, our heart shouldn't be divided. Yeah. So I wrote in my note, I said, lack of absolute commitment to God or lack of loyalty to God will make a man serve him and serve idols at the same time. Lack of It is lack of loyalty or absolute commitment to God which makes us serve him and serve an idol. You know, again, I, 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 marriage keeps coming to my mind tonight. A man, and, and this is something women often don't understand, that a man may love his wife and love somebody else too. You know? A, a, a man goes out and sleeps with another woman. And the wife takes it as, ah, oh, he you don't love me anymore. That's why you did what you did. That's not the case. So, the man loves his family. Well, sometimes that may happen because there's been relationship breakdown and all that. But there 
cases where the man loves his wife, loves his family, but he's stupid enough to love something else too. The same way he loves his car, as much as it, so, <clears throat> some women are secondary to their husband's car or their husband's gadgets. You know, it's like if anything happens to <laughs> your car breaks down, <laughs> Your wife has an accident, or no, maybe an accident is pushing it. You know, your wife is stuck somewhere. Your wife needs help. Your car breaks down, and you, each but you need to look at the man. You look at how he reacts. You know, some men are washing their car, and it's like you think they're speaking tender to a loving. new a new girlfriend. Tender, loving care. You know? A pet. A pet. They spend hours <laughs> polishing, polishing the car. And yet the wife says, oh, we need to talk or we have something we need to say. What? Well, I don't have time. I'm busy. I don't have time. But he can spend hours on other things. So there is something strange in how a man is wired up that he can love his wife and then yet still love something else. But again, that's an example of a divided, of a divided, of a divided heart. All right. Okay. Um... Let's go to verse, what was the other verse I said we we're going to look at? Verse 11 to 13? Yep. Yeah, let's go to verse 11 to 13. Hosea chapter 10, verse 11 to 13. Okay, can we read? Um, yeah, please do. 11, sorry. It says, Ephraim is a trained ephah, mm -hmm. right? That loves to trash gray mm -hmm. boy a nest a fair neck i'll make you frame pull a plow mm -hmm. judah shall plow jacob shall break his clothes mm -hmm. sow for yourselves righteousness mm -hmm. reap in mercy mm -hmm. break up your fallow ground mm -hmm. for it is time to save the lord mm -hmm. till he comes and rains righteousness mm -hmm. upon you mm -hmm. you have plowed wickedness mm -hmm. you have reaped iniquity mm -hmm. you have eaten the fruit of lies mm -hmm. because you trusted in your own way in the multitude of Mighty Thank you. Can we just pick out two lessons from, from this scripture? Anybody, anything stand out to anybody here? Let's just pick out two. What is the charge here? Positive or negative? Because there are two there. Um, that no man can serve two masters. Thank you. Two masters. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Now these are part of scriptures that mm, sometimes we just don't read because it is not story-like and all that. Okay, let's let's let let, let me show you. Okay. okay, go on. Yeah. Yeah, it's um when you what it says you have plowed wickedness. Mm. So plowing is when you when you start you know tilling a land, preparing you, your land, preparing a land, and when you put in wickedness, mm -hmm. then you will definitely reap the rewards of it, which is iniquity or. Yeah the consequence of that sin yeah and you said you have eaten the fruit of lies because you trusted in your own way mm. so sometimes it says a man's uh, um, um, a man's um, there's a scripture that says a man is god that directs our ways or something like that mm -hmm. it, yeah a man plans but it's at the end of the day it's it god, god it is god who directs our ways so correct it's just for us to know that yeah our absolute trust should be in god amen Pastor Vincent. Yeah. Can I also say that, um, is it that God also requires 100% of our loyalty in yeah. terms of that too, that he will also um, destroy all false gods probably yeah. in our lives? Exactly. Yeah, correct. That's, that's correct. Aaron J. Green. That's correct. So just to summarize these three verses, Ephraim is a trained heifer, God, uh, heifer which is a cow. God trains us in a relationship with him and when we abide by that training it says that loves to trash grain the bible says my yoke is easier my body is light yeah that's in matthew chapter 11 verse 28 to 29 thereabout so god wants to put his yoke easy yoke on us when he does that he takes us through grains he takes us through labor, which is profitable to us. So if you read, uh, there's a scripture in Deuteronomy. Oh, I didn't, I didn't write it down, did I? I think, uh, oh, I thought I did. 
So it says, do not muzzle the ox. Yeah, Deuteronomy 25 verse 4. Do not muzzle the ox that treads the grain. So when God is taking you through your discipline, your, his plan, the path he has chosen for you, he blesses you along the way. But when we refuse and we rebel, then he turns us to, he asks us to plow the ground ourselves. So that's why he says, I will make Ephraim pull a plow. Judah shall plow. Jacob shall break his clothes. It means that instead of taking you through harvest, I will take you through the planting season and you'd have to do it yourself, which is way harder because one, the grounds are hard and number two, there's nothing to eat. So in doing that, it then says in verse 12, instead of me sowing seeds of righteousness into your life, guess what? You now must sow to yourself, for yourselves, righteousness. And then you will reap in mercy. You need to break your fallow ground and seek me till I come and rain righteousness on you. When we refuse God's counsel, when we refuse the path he's chosen for us, out of rebellion, he then leaves us and asks us to do the hard work ourselves. That's the key message in that passage. We then have to sow to ourselves in righteousness. We then have to break up our fallow ground. We then have to seek him. Because by then, he has departed from us. Remember Samson on the laps of Delilah? Yep. After she cut his seven locks, you know? The Bible says when she began to torture him, he said, I will arise as before, and I will go out against the Philistines. He said, but he did not realize that the Lord had departed from him. I pray the Lord will not depart from us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. Let's, let's move on to, was any question on that? Any question? Any question on that before we move on? Yeah? Okay. Um, if you have any question, please put it in the chat or raise up your hand or just feel free to ask and we'll address them. Let's go to chapter 11. So in chapter 11, we're going to look at verse 1 to 4 and verse 7 to um, 12 thereabouts. But let's start from verse 1 to 4. It says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. Out of Egypt, I called my son. As they called them, so they went from them, they sacrificed to Baals and burned incense to carved images. I taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love. I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. Anything stand out to anybody here? What's the scripture saying? Before I before I give my view on it, anything to anybody? Sir. Yes, go on. So, <clears throat> my take is that uh, you know uh, God, uh, when Israel was a child, when we were children, mm -hmm. listen, He loved us. Yeah. Right. Correct. He called the son out of Egypt. He brought us out of darkness. Yeah. Correct. Um, but the more I called to him, the further he moved from me. Mm. So the, the more, you know, I think us as humans in, in general terms, yeah. continue to, to gain knowledge for ourselves. We continue to deviate from God. And as, as God continues to call on us, we continue to rebel. Mm. And he taught himself, he taught uh, Israel to walk, even within, with all the rebellion. And all the sacrifices to uh, Baal and stuff like that, God still taught Israel to walk. He brought, uh, he taught Israel to 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 create for themselves, to sustain themselves. And then by leading them out of the hand, so you know, by leading them by the hand, so you know how they went slavery, and He still had plans for them in slavery. They went through all the trials and tribulations that they went through. Mm -hmm. He still had He had plans for those that. Um, that were out of the country, those that were in Babylon and those that were in Jerusalem. So he, you know, with all that, he still had plans for all of them. So, well, you know, 
Israel still felt that, or humans in general still feel that, because God has shown us so much love, it mm. feels as though it's a, it's a burden to us. Like mm. we don't need it. We can, we can uh, walk for ourselves. We can mm. carry ourselves. In verse four, I lead Israel. I led Israel along with my hope of kindness and love. I lifted my yoke. I lifted the yoke from his neck, and I myself took to feed him. So God, as God pretty much fed them in, uh, you know, literally out of Egypt. Yeah. Uh, he lifted the yoke out of their neck. He brought them out of, um, brought them out of slavery in Babylon as well. So, you know, just in general, it's just humans uh, rebellion uh, against God. Thank you. Thank you. That's really good. Well done. Thank you. Yes. I think for me to, to just make it a bit more simpler. Thank you, Femi, for that. It's, um, it's relatable to how parents raise their children. Hmm. And, you know, when a child, you carry a child in the womb, um, you give back to that child, you nurture them, um, you hold them by their hands, you're happy when they take their first step. And, you know, you just all hand hold them. And, and honestly, I know most parents, you, you, it's like your parents for life. Yeah. Even when they are having children, you are still, it's like you're starting all over again. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, when you've done all of that for a child, they, they do say here in the United Kingdom, if you are sending a child from the time the child is born, right up to the time they go to university, you're going to spend about approximately £250,000 on buying nappies, is it, and tuition, is it 500000 now? Yeah. So I'm being, I'm being very conventional. Um, 5000 uh, conservative, sorry. Thank you. 5,000 uh, buying nappies or institution, after school club, different things we spend money on. And then that child now gets into a stage where they can now support. Let's not even talk about they can support you, but just that child walking away from you mm. or walking away from your life and say, I've got nothing to do with you. Mm. I guess that's the way God feels when he was yeah. talking about Ephraim exactly. and talking about, you know, the children of Israel. Yeah, um, yeah, that, 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 that's, that, that's correct. Um, so verse 1. He was a child, loved by God, out of Egypt, he called his son, that Jesus fulfilled that scripture also in Matthew chapter 2, verse 15, when he went to Egypt and stayed for two years and came back, and Matthew said it was to fulfill the prophecy that out of Egypt I've called my son. So if you jump from verse 1 to verse 3, that was the infancy of the nation of Israel, where God taught him how to walk, taking them by the arms, they didn't know that he healed them. He drilled them with cuts, with bands of love and all that. He stooped and he fed them. But what was their response? It was in verse 2. As God called them, they went away from him. As he sent his prophets to them, they went away from him and they sacrificed to other gods. They sacrificed to Baal. I've said this before, but for those of you who maybe have not said this too, if there was an idol God hated the most in the land of Israel and Judah or in Canaan generally, it's this God called Baal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's there are gods, numerous gods in the land of Canaan. You've got Dagon of the Philistines. You've got uh, I'll come to Ashira in a moment. You've got Chemosh, the god of destruction of the Moabites. You've got Baal. And why Baal is so special is Baal means my owner, my master. So actually, the world or my husband. So actually, you find some women calling their husbands Baal, my husband or my owner. Some even call God Baal, my owner, the one who owns my life, and all that. But there was this particular God, very popular God, also known as Baal. So instead of people coming to God and saying, God, you are my Lord, they go to Baal and say, Baal, you are my owner. You, are my owner. you own me. I am yours. I am your bride. And guess what? One of the ways they worship Baal is by kissing it on the mouth. A wood, a common wood. Men will bend low to kiss it on the mouth to show 
affection to Bea. So that was why God really, really hated Bea. And then Asherah was Baal's wife, who they also worship. So when you see the image of Baal, you will see an Asherah pole beside that God. And one thing was common to all of these gods, it's sexual depravity, all of them. So that's why God will always talk about halotry and idolatry or adultery and idolatry because anyone who was an idolater in that time will be involved in sexual promiscuity. The priests were there to sleep with women and men. So that's why God really, really hated this bear of a thing. But I think we've learned enough lessons from, um, from, from these scriptures. God wants to be our parent for life. He doesn't just want to be our parents when we're young and we're trying to find our ways before we got that job, before we had that marriage, before those children came and we're asking him, God, please help me. He wants to be our parent for life. He wants to take care of us till our old age, till the time when we meet, when we go meet with him. So it's important that we bear that in mind. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's so many stories in the Bible of how God helped men, but I think the one that readily comes to mind is Uzziah. Mm. Uzziah, I think, is in Second Chronicles 26. It says he was 16 years old when he became king. Yeah. And then God helped him. God helped him. God helped him all through the wars. He built towers. And all that. But it says in verse 16, it says, but when he was strong, mm. his heart was lifted up to his destruction. Mm. <laughs> you know, for he transgressed against God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn an incense. And the, the prayer is that when we become strong, when God has marvelously, he said if Uzziah was marvelously helped. Mm. So when God has marvelously helped us and we have become strong, may pride not get into our hearts. Amen, heart. amen, amen. Amen. I'll just read the sentence I wrote, two sentences I wrote in my notes, and then we'll move on. It says, I said, we must never be too proud to acknowledge how the Lord took us from wherever he saved us from and made us into what we are today. It is a sin to accord God's goodness to either luck, chance, hard work, nature, or something. You know, something just said to me that I should apply for that job and I applied for it and I got it. It wasn't something, it was the Holy Spirit. Mm. Or, how comes you're so successful, madam? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> 16 hours a day work, um, <laughs> what do you expect? Mm. You know, we've got to be careful that we don't give God's glory to other things. Yeah, we've got to be careful not to do that. Okay. Let's go to chapter 12, where we're going to spend um, a considerable amount of time I thought you said this two, evening. Seven to 12 as well. Yeah, we spent 7 to 12. No, okay, verse 7. So, for example, verse 7 just reiterates what we said already. It says, my people are bent on backsliding from me. Though they call to the Most High, none at all exalt him. That's another sign of a divided heart. It's not in the profession, it is in the action. Hmm. Our faith is not in our profession, hmm. it is in our action. Our faith is not in our profession. It's not how well we can call Jesus. It's not how, uh, it's not the sticker on our cars, if we still use stickers. It, it's not the, the size of our Bible. It, it, it's not how eloquent we can pray or sing or pray in tongues. It's not even how much scriptures we can quote, although it's good to quote scriptures, it's good to commit scriptures. It is in our action, our behavior, and most especially where our heart is. It is this for where your heart is, there, there your treasure will be also. Yeah? Okay. Let's move on to chapter 12, which is probably um, a compendium or, or, or like a uh, bringing together of the whole book of Hosea. And I'll read from verse 2. It says, The Lord also brings a charge against Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways. According to his deeds, he will recompense him. Question, people, Bible scholars, who was Jacob in the Bible? Basically. 
founder of the nation of Israel. The founder of the nation of Israel. I put a question mark on that. A cheat. A cheat. It's us, brother. Ah, uh, 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 okay, yeah, two is enough. Thank you. A cheat and Esau's brother. Yes. Uh, uh, Who was Jacob in the Bible? A six son. A man who fought with God. Thank you. A six son. A six son. He was the one that served um, 14 years. Was it seven years for Leha and then Rachel or vice versa? The other way around. He <laughs> was the one who served for 14 years just to get two wives. Wives, yeah, that's it. We have a very, very spiritual answer here in the chat. Jacob. He fought an angel. He fought an angel to Thanks, be able Dorita. to be and turn yeah. to Israel. Exactly. He fought an is he fought an angel and he was changed from Jacob to Israel. Oh. Thank you, everyone. Those are those are really, really good answers. Now look at verse. So verse 2 says, the Lord also brings a charge. This is Hosea 12, verse 2. The Lord also brings a charge against Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways, according to his deeds, meaning according to his actions, either positive or negative, he will recompense him. We also in our day and time will be paid according to our, will be rewarded according to our actions, either positive or negative. Uh, one of my favorite scriptures, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. It says, For we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ for us to be repaid according to all that we have done in the flesh, whether good or bad. Or bad. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Anyways, this scripture tells us about Jacob. So here was Hosea now comparing the people to Jacob. And we're going to see a positive example and we're going to see a negative example that's why i love scripture because it's so balanced now the positive example verse 3 he took his brother by the heel in the womb and in his strength he struggled with god yes he struggled with the angel and prevailed he wept and sought favor from him he found him in bethel and there he spoke to us that is the lord god of hosts the Lord is his memorable name. One key lesson we need to take away tonight is that we must be fighters. Yeah? We must be what? Fighters. Jacob lived his life as a fighter. He fought some good battles, he fought some wrong battles. I'm not talking about wrong, and I'll, 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 I'll make it clear tonight that yes, we fight good battles. We don't waste our energy on wrong battles. We fight good battles, but we must be, we have to be fighters. How was Jacob a fighter? In Genesis chapter 25, number one, at the time when both of them were in the womb, he struggled with his brother. It was so bad, Rebecca had to go to God, and like God if pregnancy is meant to be a thing of joy, right. why am I suffering like this? You know, I, I, I bet you must have gotten to a point where she'll see one part of her tummy just shoot out. You know, maybe one ramp the head of the other one in that direction. At the other time, he sees a feet just shoot out. At the other time, it's like a fist and all that. They struggled yeah. in her womb. And she was like, God, you know what? I know it sounds like a scene from Hollywood. But well, let's go there. Genesis 25. We'll show you quickly. Genesis chapter 25. Yeah. Verse. Oh, yeah. Read. No, no. Let's read NKJV from 21. He says. Yeah, yeah. He says, Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife uh -huh. because she was barren, yeah. and the Lord granted his plea. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. It is a man's responsibility to plead to God on behalf of his wife. That's one of his key responsibilities and all that. God help our men in our generation. 
for all for most of us it's our wives praying for us mm -hmm. it's meant to be the other way around but anyways yeah uh, we'll, we'll raise that at a men's meeting in future mm. amen <laughs> now isaac pleaded with the lord for his wife because she was barren and the lord granted his plea mm. and rebecca his wife conceived yeah but the children struggled together within her she mm. said if all is well why am i like this mm. so she went to inquire of the lord mm. if all is well why mm. am i like this if pregnancy is meant to be a thing of joy why am I in constant pain? Why am I struggling? She then went and inquired of the Lord. Yes, go on. Oh, I wanted to go to any too. So she went to inquire of the Lord, and mm -hmm. the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, two people shall be separated from your body. Mm -hmm. One people shall be stronger than the other, mm -hmm. and the older shall serve the younger. Mm -hmm. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, mm -hmm. indeed there were twins in her womb. Right. And the first came out red. It was like a hairy garment mm -hmm. all over. So they called his name Esau. Afterward his brother came out and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore him. Thank you. She bore them. So Jacob's first struggle was in the womb, fighting with his brother that there is a future ahead of us. And it looks like it's been set for you, but I'm not going to allow that happen. Secondly, when he was born, as his brother came out and he was coming out, he held, just imagine a picture in your mind, a baby, twins, mm -hmm. holding the heel of the other one, like not releasing him, as he was coming out into the world, holding the heel, of the other one saying, you might go ahead of me, but guess what? This is not the end of our story. Mm. I will fight you to the end because I want that blessing as much as you. And all through his life, he fought. He fought to marry. He fought to gain wealth. He fought to build his family uh, and all that. But most importantly, finally, he fought with God. God knew Jacob was so strong. And God visited him like a man, you know, and fought with Jacob. And guess what? Jacob just saw this man appear, and the man started wrestling with him, and they fought all night. And when day was breaking, God said, you know what? I've got to leave you now. I've got to go. And he taught Jacob's hip, and Jacob's hip became dislocated. Now, you would have thought that Jacob, so, so you know, you know, in the scripture there, it says Jacob fought with God and he prevailed. How did he prevail? Was it that he beat God? Was it that he won? He did not know. But the man held on to God and said, I will not let you go until you bless me. You know, I will not let you go until you bless me. And that, this is the beauty of scripture. When you bring two scriptures together and you compare them side by side and you learn from them. In verse 4, Hosea 12, 4, it says, Yes, he struggled with the angel, so that's God, and prevailed. He wept and sought favor from him. How did he prevail? He prevailed in the place of prayers and tears to get what he needed for his next level. That was how he won. It wasn't that like he won the battle. It wasn't that like he won the wrestling match. It was that he won by getting the blessing he had always wanted. And my charge to us tonight is don't settle for less. less than what God has planned for your life. Don't settle for less. Learn to fight your battle in his presence with prayers and tears. The Bible says, even Jesus, and this is Hebrews chapter 7, I believe, even Jesus prayed and sought God with tears. And he was hard in that he feared, because he feared God. Let's be, a, if we find a situation around us that we don't like, let's war in God's presence. If God has made a promise to you that this is what you're going to become, go and fight it on your knees. Not with humans. Don't go fight your husband or your children or your manager at work. Some of us out of frustration, we're fighting the wrong people. We need to war in God's presence. 
in the place of prayers and tears and say to God, I will not let you go until you bless me. Mm. And guess what? He will hear us. So, so, Pastor, can we then, uh, if we have a request and we go to God and we say, I will not let you go until you give me this request. Is that, is that right? Because God may not want that for you. So remember I said, I will not let you go until you bless me. So that's predicated on a few things. One, you know what God's will is for your life, but it is not happening. God has promised you, you've seen it in this world, or it's been said to you that this is what you should be. You carry this grace, you have X, you have Y, but you're not seeing the reality of it. Or it's a situation in your home, there's a problem with your child, there's a problem with your job, there's a problem with your health. Instead of getting used to using ibuprofen and paracetamol three times, four times a day, war with God in the place of prayer. Jesus. And say, Lord, help me. Jabez was a good e example. Um, First Chronicles chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. His mom called him Jabez, saying, you will cause pain. He prayed. He said, Lord, I don't want to cause pain. In fact, make me the exact opposite of my name. Give me lands. Make sure no evil comes near me. And the Bible says, and God granted him his request. God wants us to fight it out. If your fight is you don't know what he wants you to do, then go work that one out too. Lord, I'm confused. I don't know the way forward. Help me out here. And he will answer our prayers as he did, as he did, as he did Jacob. Right. So that's a positive example. He was a fighter all his life. And at the end of the day, his fight won him the victory because he fought in the right place. Now, let's look at, let's look at a negative example. Go to verse 12. Verse 12. Very, very interesting. Uh, it says, Jacob fled to the country of Syria. Israel served for a spouse. And for a wife, he tended sheep. By prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt. And by prophet, he was preserved. Ephraim provoked him to anger most bitterly. Therefore, his Lord will leave the guilt of his bloodshed upon him and return his reproach on him. Question. Why did Jacob flee to the country of Syria? Anybody? Why? Not when he, um, he, he uh, took his brother's blessings by cheating him. He cheated his brother and had to run away. Yeah. Any other any other thoughts on that? Anybody? Why did he run away from home? His mom encouraged him. His mom also encouraged him. So remember, we said he was a fighter. He had always been a fighter. So a time came, well, he took that strain from someone and that person was his mom. Jacob was just like his mom. You see, we've got to be careful as parents because our strengths and weaknesses can easily be reflected in the lives of our children. Rebecca came from the family line of Laban and Nahor and these are people who always get what they want either through hook or crook. If they want it, they get it. So that was where Jacob got his strain from, his strain of, I'm a fighter, I must get what I want. Of course, God wanted him to be a fighter, but only in his presence, you know, not cheating other people. So you know the story, he cheated his brother and Isaac blessed him rather than his brother. But you know, something has always amazed me. When Isaac found out that Jacob had deceived him, why didn't he revoke the blessing and give it to Esau? Anybody? That's my, that's my question. That, 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 that's, that's a question I've not found an answer to in the Bible. Anybody? Anybody has any thoughts on that? I think it's because, um, it's because he has already invoked the blessing and it cannot be retrieved. 
And just like the Bible said, whoever God has blessed, there is uh, no man can withdraw it. That's just my contribution. Okay. He's invoked a blessing and it can't be taken back. Okay, yeah. I, I think it was from, from the scripture we read, it was already predestined that Jacob hmm. was going to get that blessing. Because even when he, when the mom went to the um, the prophet to inquire of the Lord, right? He says the younger shall serve the older shall serve the younger. Yeah. So it was just like you know last week, Pastor, when you were talking about Judas, that it it was predestined that someone was going to betray um, Jesus. Um, Jesus. Yeah. But it didn't. It wasn't specifically Judas. But because Ju Judas made himself that you know available to the enemy, mm. then it, Judas was. Mm -hmm. Right? So the same way, even though God, God had already predestined it, remember when um, um, Jacob was praying for um, Joseph's children? Yeah. Even though he couldn't see, he placed his right hand on the younger one. So there are some things that God had predestined. Mm. But then, um, Rebecca did not inquire, Lord, how will this be? Mm. Rebecca wanted, knew what, what was predestined, but she now used her own crooked way. Of saying to the brother, you know what? Well, let the blame be on me. You need to get this blessing. Mm. So, mm. Mm. thanks. So for it that. was predestined. And you know that raises that raises quite a few questions. Who prayed for Rebecca to get pregnant so she can have children? From the passage we read this evening, the man. I think. Yeah, the woman was barren. The man went to God. We don't know how long he prayed for, but we know that they were married for twenty years before they had their children. Yeah. 20 years of, Isaac married at 40, okay. he gave birth at 60. So for 20 years they were married. We don't know how long he prayed for hmm. within those 20 years before his wife eventually conceived. Hmm. And then she conceived and the pregnancy was turbulent. It was like a storm inside her tummy. And she went and inquired of the Lord and the Lord told her X, Y, Z. My question is, did she share that knowledge with her husband or not? I'm so not I, sure. She... I, sorry, ma'am. I, I think her husband would have known that she was she was having issues with the pregnancy. The husband was there. Correct. Right? So and she would have probably told her husband, I'm going to inquire of the Lord. Mm -hmm. This this is just too much. Mm -hmm. And when she came back, so it's not just her telling the husband, it's the husband taking that responsibility of I prayed. God answered. Now let's. So the husband should have been involved in all of the, uh, all of the stages. So in asking, okay. Um, so what did this, what did the prophet say? Okay, let's pray about it again. And then when the children came and there was so much issue, but they, they both loved food, so uh, they were carried away with raising the children than going to prayer. Right. Sorry. So. Practical, practical, practical stuff. Yes, ma'am, you wanted to say something. You're on mute. Okay. Right. So, um, uh, a few practical issues here. Number you one, favoritism is terrible, destroys families. Because you saw that in this household. Isaac loved Esau because of the meats, the barbecue meats. He brings home the venison, you know, tasty, succulent steak that he makes for him. And Jacob was loved by his mom because he was always in the kitchen with her and they were always talking about the woman at the market who didn't <laughs> dress properly, the, you know, all of those things. And that created a schism between them, Isaac, Esau, Rebecca, Jacob. We would never know, well, maybe when we get to heaven, we can always ask Isaac, did Rebecca share this revelation with you? We would never know. And also, at the point where Isaac decided that he was going to bless Esau, did he call Rebecca into the room and share his thoughts with her? I don't know, but it looks to me like something was just not right in that relationship around how they raised their children. 
and we still see a lot of that today where we're not agreeing on how to raise our children where for one it is permissible for the other it is it must not happen and we need to come together and agree lest our children turn out as oh, that's daddy's child that's mommy's child it doesn't help anyone yeah i found children who will call home so this is later in life now call home is daddy around oh no he's not and all that oh okay mommy's fine a oh, mommy said no no it's okay it's okay it's okay they will only talk when daddy is home or only visit when daddy is there or only visit when mommy is there we shouldn't raise our children as such if anything is suggesting to you that you should love one child more than the other it's an evil spirit you need to cast it out yeah you have what i said it's an evil spirit you need to cast it out we must love our children unconditionally love them equally and all that but that didn't happen in this family and at the end of the day jacob got the blessing even though it was a mark for him but he got it the wrong way but okay sorry sorry people i, I know we're taking time on this but I, i'll try to round up in a minute but it's so important what do you do when you see something that god has promised you filtering away to somebody else what do you do was okay uh yummy said uh, yeah okay yeah so i'll pick that up what do you do what what could rebecca have done differently when she had that isaac said esau go fetch go into the bush uh, go wherever um kill an animal make me the barbecue meat i love and then i'll bless you and she knew that the blessing was meant to be for jacob what should she have done what do you do in practical terms when something is marked for you you know god has said this is yours that thing is being given to another person what do you do how do we respond to that it's a practical question it's a life question anybody this concerns all of us anybody ah okay so i'll take that thanks yomi uh so we've got or uh, what is your motive for the request i think um okay i don't think she told him some women believe some deep things should be kept secret to avoid trouble amongst children understandably so how can you say that oh um even though he's the older one but actually the younger one will be greater than him if you know such things you keep it to yourself you don't even tell the children at all and I don't, I don't think rebecca told jacob that this was the revelation she saw or maybe during their kitchen practical she might have told him but such things i agree with you you keep it to yourself so in answer to my question pray first and let god intervene mm. any other thoughts first i think she should have uh, but like you said i think there's some things that are intrinsically wrong with that marriage mm. because Rebecca knew that um, and then probably she didn't share with her husband mm -hmm. because if if Isaac had known Isaac was a man of prayer yeah right he would have at least committed it to God God how direct us how do you want us to go about this this um, blessing mm -hmm. right and I think Isaac as well even though his wife I believe Rebecca was cooking for him but he just loved food anyway because Esau was always doing. He loved he could, meat. He could have called Esau and um, um, Rebecca and said, "You know what? This is what I'm thinking about." Yeah. And I think it's around communication. But it was the same way though that um, they said in Mary. Every time they said something about Jesus, they said she kept it in her heart. Mm. Did she discuss with her husband? Mm. We don't know. We don't know. Yeah, the things that women keep in their hearts. God help us all. The way I know. things men keep in their hearts. I know, exactly. Women. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> you know, uh, I'm going to say something slightly controversial here, but I, I, I'll say it anyway. This is, this is a time, uh, for Rebecca's family especially, when that was happening, and it was like, 
Isaac wanted um, Esau to be blessed rather than Jacob. That was a time when Rebecca was meant to go to her husband and like, I won't allow you to do that because we know what God has said. You know? Rather than looking for a cunning way of getting the blessing, that was the time she could have said, you know what, sir, you are not going to do this. I won't allow you bless, the, especially when Esau was out of the house, when he'd gone to get the meat. It was the time for her to go to her husband. I know what God has said. If I've not told you before, I'm telling you now, you are not going to bless Esau. And if you're not sure about what I'm telling you, go pray about it. God will speak to you. Go and inquire. And if she had done that, and Isaac had inquired, and Isaac had changed his mind, and he had called Esau, and I told Esau, I can't bless you, one, because the blessing is not for you. Number two, you've married strange women. So I can't give you the blessing anyway. Number three, I learned you've sold your birthright to your brother. So you don't qualify anymore. Then what we see in this Hosea chapter 12, would not have happened. But because they were so deceitful, Rebecca and Jacob, and got the blessing in a deceitful way, what was the consequence of their actions? Number one, it was the last time Rebecca would see Jacob alive. From the moment he left home, by the time he returned 20 years later, Rebecca had died. So that was the last time. <laughs> Last time she saw him alive. Number two, Jacob had to pay for his deception. He went and lived with an uncle who was a senior deceiver. Jacob's level was level one. Laban's level was level 1000. For seven years, he served to marry Rachel. And on the night, Laban got him drunk and pushed Leah into the room. He woke up the next morning to find another lady beside him. And when he said, Uncle, what have you done to, to me? His uncle said, oh, oh, no, no. The younger, the older can't remain unmarried whilst we give out the younger. Serve me, fulfill her days, seven days, and I will give you Rachel. But you will then have to serve me for another seven years. So he spent 14 years serving to get, to get Rachel, the woman he really loved. And then spent another six years serving, making 20 in total. And at the end of the day, he had to run away from Laban. So yeah. The man cheated him. And why, why is this so sad? His father, Isaac, got his wife in 24 hours because he was a man of prayer and meditation when it was time to marry abraham said i'm going to get a wife for my son isaac didn't argue he just went and prayed lord whoever daddy will get will be the right person and god ordered the steps of the servant to abraham's family and from there he brought rebecca and that was how Isaac got his wife in 24 hours. But his own son, it was a day's journey, he says. Oh, no, actually, yeah, that's true. Yeah. But at least from the moment he saw her, they were pretty much as good as married. They got married. Unlike Jacob, who saw the woman he loved and for 14 years had to serve. You know? So... When we try to, I wrote in my notes, I said, don't force God's promise. Don't force God's promises through deceit and physical methods. Don't force it. Allow God. Work with your promises through faith and righteousness and the blessings will be yours. Even if Isaac had blessed Esau that day, the blessing would not have stuck. Because Esau was the wrong candidate. For that, for that blessing. Anyways, don't force God's promises through deceit or physical methods. War with your promises through faith and righteousness and the blessings will be yours.
it was no excuse that uh, we we did it we did it deceitfully because we knew it was ours anyways you know the lies that these young people say to themselves you know i love you and i'm going to marry you but right now i need you you know and the rest is history teenage pregnancy and all of that so don't force god's promises through deceit or physical means walk with your promises through faith and righteousness and the blessings will be yours the blessings will be yours right okay and then look at verse 13 of that same scripture hosea 12 13 this is a scripture you might want to memorize if you're looking for a scripture to memorize this is a very very good one you might want to commit to heart it says by a prophet the lord brought israel out of egypt and by a prophet he was preserved by a prophet the lord brought israel out of egypt and by prophet he was preserved what does that mean you have a prophet over your life amen you have a prophet over god has appointed a prophet over your life whose role is to show you god's will god's plan god's word for you yeah i hope we got that any questions before we move on any questions any questions from anyone lots to think about right okay let's move on because of time who um ah well thanks yeah thanks yummy um rebecca didn't eat the fruit of her labor she didn't eat the fruit of her labor even though she said you know it was like rachel when rachel gave back to joseph she named him god will add another in my mind i think she was meant to only have one child one not two the other child in the process of giving back to him she died he died she died he died oh she died. she died the prophecy was fulfilled later that the sun the father the moon the mother and the 11 stars bowed down to jacob to joseph so his father his mother and his brothers were meant to bow down to him who was missing in the equation the mom the mom yeah okay yes what's the question um what does israel mean what does israel mean anybody what does israel mean does anyone know it's in genesis where he fought with god it's in genesis he's a i don't know Genesis 32. Wrestled with God. Yeah. And prevailed. And prevailed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or tri triumphant with God. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, well done. A prince of God. One who fought with God and, and prevailed. prevailed. Yeah. yeah, that's what it means. It says, and he said, Genesis 32, 28. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. You have struggled with God and with men and has and have prevailed. Israel means God fights on my behalf. A prince of God on whose behalf God fights. God fights on my behalf. That's Israel. Anywhere you see El in a name, you know that's God anyways. So God fights on my behalf. That's what Israel means. Okay. Any other question before we quickly browse through the last two chapters of Hosea? No? Okay. Let's go to Hosea 13 then. Hosea chapter 13. Um, verse 1. 
When Ephraim spoke trembling, he exalted himself in Israel, but when he offended through Baal worship, he died. Humility, those who fear God will be exalted, and those who forsake him will be abased. Those who fear God will be exalted. When Ephraim spoke trembling, when Ephraim spoke with the fear of God in his heart, when Ephraim spoke knowing that he could do all things through Christ who strengthened him, he was exalted in Israel. But when he offended through Baal worship, when he turned his back on God, when he forsook God through the worship of Baal, he died. Like Adam, Adam, he died spiritually first, and then eventually he died physically. He died spiritually first, and he died physically. Look at verse 2. Um, I've said this already. Now they sin more and more, and have made for themselves molded images, idols of their silver, according to their skill. All of it is the work of craftsmen. They say to them, let the men who sacrifice kiss the cows. You know when I was talking about kissing Baal on the mouth? So you can see there. It says, let them kiss. Let them kiss the cows. Kissing is a sign of affection. And instead of showing that affection to God, they were showing it to their idols. Something which, of course, God dislikes. Something which God does not approve of. Something which God hates. Verse 5. I knew you in the wilderness, in the land of great doubt. No matter what you're going through today, God is with you in that situation. He says, I knew you in the wilderness. Most times when we're in the wilderness, we think God has forsaken us. But when we're in the wilderness, God is, in fact, he is nearer to us in the wilderness than at any other time. We might not see him. You've had the story of a man who was walking with Jesus and he could see footprints in the sand. He saw four prints, then he saw two prints, and then he saw four prints again in a vision with Jesus. And then he asked Jesus, what does this mean? Four prints, two prints. Of in, in the sand and then another four prints and Jesus said we were walking together when you saw those four prints mine and yours is that about the time when you oh so the man when the man saw two prints the man turned to the Lord and said Lord that, does that mean that you forsook me you left me alone to walk alone in the wilderness left me all by myself and Jesus said no when you saw the four prints that was me and you walking when you saw the two prints, it was the time I carried you. Yeah? And that's what God does for us. When we are unable to walk, when we're in the wilderness, what does he do? He carries us. And the only two, the footprints we see in the sand are just two. And oftentimes we think it's our own, but it is not. It is God's footprints in our, in our lives. In our lives, right? Ah, uh, okay. Verse 10, no, verse 9. It says, Oh Israel, you are destroyed, but your help is from me. He's saying, You have rebelled, and your rebellion has caused your destruction, but your help is from me. I love the song which says, Our help is in the name of the Lord. Of the Lord. I will look up to the yes. Psalm, Psalm 121. I will lift my eyes up to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Look at verse 10, Hosea 13, 10. He says, I will be your king. Where is any other that he may save you in all your cities and your judges to whom you said, give me a king and princes. 11, I gave you a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. Who was that referring to people? So, fantastic, that's the most evident answer, correct, Saul, but there were two people actually. Who was the second one? Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great. Oh, no, 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 not at all, not at all, no, no, no. Hosea lived in the time of Isaiah, so there was no captivity, there was nothing, everything was fine at this stage. But of course, like Isaiah, he was also talking about the future. 
Who was the second king given to Israel in God's anger and taken away in his fury? Now, these are the tempting times when I was going to say 20 pounds on the one. line. But oh. no, I'm not going to say that. I already said one. Saul is one. Who's the second king? Okay. Run through a list of kings and I'll tell you when you get Is there. it Josiah? Josiah, no. Josiah was a good king. Aaron, no. It was a king at the time of the Israelites. Anybody? Which other kings do we know? Jehu. Jehu, not Jehu. Ahab. Not Ahab. His children were. J, if that helps. So I put $20 on it, I remember. Is it Jehoash? I said Jehu. Not Jehu, not Jehoash. Not Jehu. Jehoash. Jehoash. Jeroboam. Jeroboam. Yes. Jeroboam. Jeroboam was the king God gave them in his anger, the second king, and he took him away in his wrath. God gave him to them because Solomon had fallen into idolatry. And God said, I will split the kingdom. You know, gave it to them out of anger and took him away because he was the one who then introduced Israel to idolatry. And of course, the second one we know was Saul. Israel insisted that they wanted a king and they didn't want God to be king over them anymore. So Saul was given to them in his anger and taken away in his wrath. Look at verse 13. As we begin to tidy this up, the sorrows of a woman in childbirth shall come upon him. He is an unwise son, for he should not stay long where children are born. People, if the only Bible you have is just KJV or NKJV, you will struggle to understand some things in Scripture. Just download the U version on your phone, and you can, or Bible Gateway, and you can compare translations. Verse 13 in NLT, it says, Pain has come to the people, like the pain of a childbirth, but they are like a child who resists being born. Sometimes God wants to do great things in our lives, give us a change of circumstance, bless us, change our ways, but in our rebellion, we refuse to be born. We refuse to come out. Like a child in the womb who says, I'm comfortable here, I'm not going anywhere. I've heard that human beings are wicked and they do terrible things. I would rather stay in here. <laughs> but the time is right. If that child refuses to come out, what happens? C-section. Or the mother is induced to push the child out. <laughs> so that's exactly what that scripture is saying. That when we don't allow God to take his natural course in our lives, then cesarean section happens. Okay. Um, yes, final one from this, and then I'll leave you to go and study um, chapter 14 yourself. Final one, verse 14. This is a scripture that has caused a lot of controversy in the yeah, among scholars, among Bible scholars, and I'll show you why, and we'll round up here tonight. Verse 14 in KJV, KJV. He says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O oh, death, I will be thy plagues. O oh, grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from my eyes. When a lot of people read this scripture, they see it as a positive scripture. After all, he says, I will ransom them. I will redeem them. Then he talks about death, that he will be the plague to death, and he will be the destruction to the grave. And when he says repentance shall be hid from our eyes, that's interpreted as the gift and calling of God are without repentance. So God is not going to change his mind about this promise that he has made. But the truth of the matter is that exactly is the opposite of what that scripture is saying. So let's read it in the Good News Translation as we round up tonight. You can read it in your other translation and you'll get the gist. But I'll read it in good, good News Translation so you can get the idea. It says, I will not save these people from the world of the dead or rescue them from the power of death. 
Bring on your plague's death. Bring on your destruction, word of the dead. I will no longer have pity for these people. So it was the exact opposite of what he said in KJV. And unless you study and you find these things out, you might like, oh, great, where is that thing? Oh, death. In fact, even Paul quoted it in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Oh, death, where is that thing? Oh, grave, and all of that. But in the, the, the true meaning is God is saying he will punish them for their rebellion, not that he will save them from the power of the grave. We'll pack it there tonight. Hosea 14 is about repentance. Hosea calling the people to come to repentance and God saying, if you repent, I will bless you. I will change your story. That's Hosea 14. Only nine verses. Man comes to God. God blesses him when he repents. That's Hosea chapter 14. Any final thoughts on Hosea before we um, round it up tonight? We, yeah, any final thoughts? Anyone? You're all a quiet bunch tonight. And it's okay. Yeah. So from next week, we're looking at Joel. Joel has three chapters, so we're going to look at Joel and then dive into Amos also, and then stay on Amos for a few, for maybe two weeks, and then get into another book. So next week is Joel and Amos, Joel 1 to 3, Amos 1 to 2. Before we pray tonight, can I just remind us of the event we have on Saturday, and to plead with us that we should please, 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 okay, so I has a hand up, I'll call you in a minute. Please, 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 let's invite people. Saturday, 5 p.m., Practical Steps to Financial Freedom. TSI has a mission. God has given us a global mandate for victorious living and Christ-likeness. Through our Sunday service and our midweek services, we teach Christ-likeness. We teach scriptures, how to be like Christ. Because the more we look at him in, the, in his word, the more we become like him. But also, there's the bit about victorious living, which is winning in every area of life. And that's what we're now doing through our Saturday events. Picking up life issues, practical issues which matter to Christians, and dealing with them in a godly way. Without going through scriptures and things like that, but taking practical steps to free ourselves from some of these challenges we see every day. So please, on Saturday, invite people um, to um, uh, Practical Steps to Financial Freedom. It's 5 p.m. It's only an hour. Let's come together. You can ask questions. Everyone needs some form of financial education and all that. So let's come together. Let's have that. And I'm sure you will be there. People have been praying. People have taken out time to pray an hour each for that event on Saturday just so that we can all be blessed. So please come and let's do that together. All right, Sister Kenji, you got your hand um, up. So, um, yeah, are you on Facebook, sir? Tonight? Not tonight. Because okay, okay, that's okay. Then I'll ask my Zoom. question then. Okay, that's fine. I'm reading Zoom. Reading. Okay. Um, I just need your um, wisdom, sir. I'm in a big deep um, trouble at work and I probably wouldn't say trouble. Um, so I have a student and um, so because I've been working nights, I've actually, um, I've, of course I've been working with her for over five, six weeks. So I, I thought, okay, she, there are some competencies that we have to sort of like meet as students. And I thought she wasn't meeting that needs and we worked on it. So now because I work mostly nights, mm -hmm. so I put her to another colleague of mine to work with her. So by the time I came back um, sometime last week, I worked with her again. Now to sign those comp competencies, the midwife, she had worked with three midwives and they had given her excellent. Now, when I came back and she worked with me, I thought, now in these competencies, you had satisfactory, good, very good, and then excellent. And I thought, excellent. Now, when I came back and worked with her, there was not even a good, it was, it was actually satisfactory. So I said to myself, what could be going on? Lord, help me. So, okay, I, okay, I said to a friend of mine, who is also a, a senior colleague. Now, this student is also older than me. 
So I said, girl, I, I need your help. Could you please, you know, work with this student and then tell me what you think? And this colleague of mine gave her excellent. So I said to myself, KG, what's going on here? So I, just, I said to myself, so, and then I, okay, I sort of thought, okay, let's go back and then we try everything. And one of the big major, major example is there was a woman who was clearly, you know, honestly, a blind person could clearly see that this woman was carrying twins. And she said this woman was carrying one baby. And also, you know, different examples that I couldn't even sign good. It was all satisfactory to me. And then I had people giving this woman excellent. Now I have no time. And yes, I have to sign and my pin has to go in this form. So I don't know what, you know, what do I do? I don't want to play the devil's advocate. Again, she's crying and everyone, well, not everyone, you know, of course, I've got people that have been in that kind of situation. Of course, I've had different advices, but I also thought, you know, you know, from your idea being a manager, being in a leadership, what do you suggest that? Because I really don't honestly kind of know what to do now. Can, can I ask um, a question? Mm. Are there a set of competencies that you need to measure our with? And if they are standard competencies, you will, as, as somebody who will put your final pin on it, mm. actually measure, measure on, that, on those competencies fairly. And you need to be, you need to, it's not what people have done. Because mm. if their pin is not going on it, on, on that on that um, on, to sign the final thing you have to look at the competencies and make sure you are fair in your judgment your, your standards are not too high um, I, I guess and and that, that's that's what I want to say you, you just need to be you need to be sure in your mind that one your standards are not high two you are scoring out against those competencies and you are scoring out fairly okay and if you I think it, 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 it for me is slightly simple and the reason why I said that is you've got your professional judgment to make about these students yeah and if in your professional judgment you feel her level is satisfactory then I say put satisfactory on it at the end of the day maybe the next stage maybe you'll be reviewed or she'll be sent back or something There'll, there's a reason why you feel she's not up to scratch and remember you are in a you are in a field where uh lives where de you're dealing with lives so if we gloss through things and we move people on it's like somebody going for a driving test it's not really really good but because there is pressure here and there, we say he's okay. He goes on to cause an accident. There is regret down the line. You don't want that to happen. In your professional view, if you feel she's not satisfied, she's not up to excellent, then please do not give her excellent. And just state the reason why you feel she's not up to excellent. And that's that that would be my that would be my my view on it. Jenke? Thank you, sir. Sorry, I just wanted to say as an healthcare professional as well, you know, we've been talking about, you know, not compromising and keeping up the standards. If you have a particular belief in your heart that she's satisfactory, not, you know, she's a particular standard or competency level, there's no need for you to then compromise because everybody else is having that particular feeling or that particular standards. What you have to know is your standards is probably completely different from them. And you are the one signing her off, which means whatever you are training her to do now, she will be on her own eventually and somebody's life is gonna be in her hands. Yeah. So one needs to be very careful. I say that because I train other pharmacists or pharmacy students and I see certain things in some pharmacists and I say to them, this is not what I want. I actually said to a pharmacy student one time that I am not gonna sign you off. And she said to me, you can never do that. And I said, exactly. what? And I did that. And I said, for your own good, because you're going to be holding people's lives, people's medication, which means, and then eventually, it might not even fall down to you, but your conscience would eventually prick you in the sense that this woman eventually, or whoever the nurse is, is going to be going out there eventually 
thinking that she's the best thing after sliced bread, whereas there's certain areas that needs to be polished in her life yeah. or yeah. in her practice. So it might be worth maybe if there's still time for her, for her to get signed off for both of you to work towards it, which means if she has to work at night, she needs to work at night. And then you need to brush up that competencies to ensure that she meets those standards. And it's always best to be honest with her. So she knows that I am only, you're only doing this for her own good. She's going to go somewhere else, meet a matron that is not going to take nonsense. And they're going to, it's going to mark, you know, match on your own credibility as, yeah, exactly. as a tutor. Yeah. Oh, oh. So Thank you so much. Your own word to what you believe. Don't let anything deter you from that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Exactly. Can, Thank can, you. I say, can I say can I say one thing? I'm glad we got a consensus on that. On that. Okay. Sorry, sorry, can I just, sorry, can I just say one thing? Normally, I would normally shut up when it comes to things like this because it's not my field. But one thing that just kept on coming to mind, especially after um, did said, um, the last thing that I heard, is sometimes, I don't know why they're giving an excellent and there's a problem, but also you want to check because some people, just because they, they I don't know, let me just use the word respect, or the thing that this person knows exactly what they're doing. They feel sometimes a little intimidated when they're with you. So maybe she's not even comfortable because she just feels this person is a perfectionist. She knows what she's doing. She knows everything. Remember, she's a student. You want to make sure that she's not intimidated when she's with you and she's free with other people. That's why maybe she's doing it right with them. Do you understand? Mm, mm. Oh, but let her feel comfortable with you. Let mm. her know she's here to help. Let her know she's I don't know whether she's a lady. Maybe she's like, because some people, I get that at work as well. Like she's just too good. They feel intimidated. Not because you've done anything wrong. You're just perfect. You're just professional. Do you understand where I'm coming from? Mm, mm, people, you know, make sure that you bring her on board. Remember that, you know, you know, another thing I would say to myself, you're once on their level as well, where somebody was training you, you know, you need to come down to our standard. So maybe that can help. Do you understand? So. Mm. Okay, thank you. I mean, I, I think that's what I meant by you know when that you have not set standards that are too high. But I guess there will be competencies, definitely. No, but look at the difference though. Satisfactory yeah. to excellent. No, but from, that, like, you know, it's such a big gap though. Yeah, but from what Yomi said, probably when she's with other people, she's more comfortable. So you have to make her, you know, let her know if whatever you're doing is for her good. And because if you sign her off, she has to be doing it all on her own anyway. And just make her comfortable around you, and yeah, maybe probably take more time mm. to before you sign her off. Um, so maybe she's more relaxed with the other people because the stakes ain't as high as when she's with you, and all that. But, um, but we, you again, you it. can't compromise your standard. Mm. You, you you try to help her, try to put her at ease, try to show her, show her that. This is what you are doing. That's why we get feedback when we go for interviews, isn't it? What have I, what haven't I done well? And they can like, okay, yeah, this is where we didn't perform well. It's like, oh. got to be specific, not something just up in the air, like, oh, you know, what? you're just not good enough. What does that mean? What's the evidence? We're talking about goal development at work today. And we're talking about smart objectives. It's got to be specific, measurable achievable realistic time bound you can point to it that when you saw that woman with twins i expected you to pick it up straight away that there are twins in her we had it at bible study that esau and jacob were fighting against each other in the belly <laughs> you can have that to understand you know so it's got to be specific in terms of what you are measuring so she's not she knows it's not woolly or it's not personal Oh Lord, help me. Okay, thank you all. Thank you so much. More grace, more grace on you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. On that on that note, we'll just pray, um, and then we'll, we'll we'll round off for tonight. Let's pray, people. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. We thank you for tonight. We thank you again for the beauty of going through your word and learning at your feet. We thank you for the challenge you've thrown at us tonight. Lord, in, in so many areas, in our personal lives, in our family lives, in our relationship with our spouses, in our relationship with our children, in what we do, and even in what we've just discussed, because it is all one and the same thing. In us being like you and 
ensuring that we are doing that which is right. We pray tonight, Father, may the words that we have heard, may they benefit us in Jesus' name. May they make our lives better. May we, may we become more and more like you. The goal is Christ's likeness. May we become more and more like you, Lord Jesus, in the name of Jesus. We love you, Lord. We exalt you. By the time we meet again, Lord, may our blessings be more than this. We give you worship. We give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Well, God bless you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. For Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. you all. Take Thank care. You. Have a good evening. God bless Thank you. you all. Thank you, sir. God Thank bless you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Robert, how is your wife? We didn't hear her voice at all. Is she sleeping? No, no, I'm not sleeping. You didn't hear me at all. Good evening, how are you? I'm okay, thank you. Yes, you guys didn't uh, even contribute uh, at all. You no, did you Bible reading. I wanted to send them a text, but I said, you know, I'm going to keep uh, Maybe, uh, maybe this is... Well, I... <laughs> I was busy, so I can't. But Tuka just got back from work, so I think he's a day. Sorry, you know I would normally contribute. Yes, yeah, so you know it's good to contribute because it allows me to breathe. Yeah, because I was thinking no one's reading the Bible. No, I'm sitting here thinking somebody better read the Bible. I think you're reading the Bible. I know. It can be tiring. I don't know. Uh, sorry. I sorry. Got I got the job yesterday, and I didn't. I didn't feel anything yesterday. What job? The um vaccine. Astra, vaccine. Well, yeah, AstraZeneca. Now your feverish. Oh gosh, they put the thing in. Feeling the fever. Shoo. <laughs> well, that's part of the symptoms, isn't it? Yeah, but I didn't feel anything early today. I was just. I even did exercise. I went for a walk. I've done almost fifteen thousand steps today. Okay. Yeah, 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 she's contributing to the discussion. Yeah, yeah. it is well. How's <laughs> mom? Is she at work? Yes, yeah, she's at work. She's on her way back now. Okay, okay. Our uh, greetings to her when she comes back. Yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah. Take care, people. God bless. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. So you can log off now. Thank you. So we need to search out to create group on Facebook. You've not left. Oh, oh.